Welcome back to Hash Right Up. Today is all about the law. I had the chance to sit down with Justin Ballard, host of the Digital Wildcatters podcast. He's a lawyer, works with Archon on a bunch of things, um, organizes part of the Empower conference that happens every year in the US. Um, mainly though, we want to talk about his company, Firm 21M, 21 million, where he basically opened a legal practice or started um, consulting um, people in the mining industry with his legal expertise. I want to talk about that to him and yeah, I hope you are keen to listen. Hash right up, begins now, enjoy. All right, so like I said in the brief introduction, I am here with Mr. Justin Ballard or we just tried out different pronunciations of his name. So we, we're going to stuck, stick with the, with the real one. We are at block height 841397, uh, hash rate on the 14 day, it's 626.9. And our hash price is 50.10, just eking above that 50 limit, seeing all time lows right now and everything works as intended, pushing the network towards more efficiency. With that, Justin, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And fifty so, is up from what it was this morning, so that's good. How does that impact your operation? You run ASICs um, yourself? Well, I do. Um, I have some running, and so obviously, you know, I feel the pain as well. Um, but uh, you know, it's also one of those things where you know uh, the the resiliency of Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining is is going to be tested and. We know this is coming every four years, and so you prepare for it, and you know it's going to be a little bit of pain. But on the other side, um, we know what Bitcoin will do eventually. So it'll, it'll hopefully pay off, and hopefully everybody's prepared for for what was coming. For for um, making sure that you stay profitable, do you care to know what your all-in cost is? Did you ever look at that? Um, uh, can yeah. You share? Yeah, so... Um, Across the board for all the stuff I have operating in, look, I, I will freely acknowledge that um, I've been very blessed um, from getting to piggyback off some of the you know, best deals or best operations that I've seen set up. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've got a very low OPEX number from all in cost and you know, I'm sub five across the board on on my stuff. So. You know, I'm still doing okay. Um, I do need to get some newer machines running, which we will here in the next, you know, nine, 90 days or so, hopefully. So um, that'll make it, you know, much more profitable. But with the stuff I got running now, yeah, I'm, I'm still in the money, albeit it's getting pretty skinny. <laughs> getting scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Fair enough. Um, skinny. Second. I'll say skinny, not scary. Skinny. Okay. It, skinny. It, we'll... I I trust the 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 mining uh, endeavors, and I, I believe fully that down the road this is going to be paying off. So I, I'm not scared. I'm. It is skinny though. I know you talk to a lot of people, and we're going to get into um, what it is that you do and who you are and why you're here in a minute. Um, but with with the people that you do speak to, what sort of the general consensus of where hash price might be moving over the next six um, to 12 months? Well, there's a lot of, uh, I'd say, you know, optimistic hope that um, things are going to kind of play out as they have over the past after the having uh, occurs. Um, and I think that, you know, you kind of, if you're in the space, you're moving forward with the assumption that Bitcoin is going to continue on and kind of it's, it's got, it's, um, you know, the more that it's adopted, it's going to have more appeal and it's going to add to the revenues for the miners. So I, I think there's, there's cautious optimism, I guess, is how I'd look at it. Everybody knew this is coming. We all see it. The having's coming, obviously, you know, every four years, we know when, basically when it, is going to occur so I, I think everybody who's in it knows this is happening but you know you never know we are in a different kind of market than we have been in the past uh kind of a macroeconomic situation so i think there's still some concern about how things will play out given the overall kind of world's economic footing compared to where it has been since bitcoin was really um conceived back in 2009 so 
you know, I, I think there's going to be a little bit of a lull right here where people are still trying to wait and see what happens, especially from the, the bigger market cap players um, and see what, what they're going to be looking to do over the next six to nine months. But um, I think everybody kind of expects Bitcoin, the ETFs to come in. So hopefully that's provided a little bit of a floor on the price. Um, and so, you know, if we if if this hopefully is kind of the bottom we're going to see and we see things ramp up over time, um, waiting to see too what kind of miners end up getting turned off, if any, if there's any bit, any difficulty drop over the next, you know, two to three months. Um, I think that's going to be really telling um, time is because that's when probably the hash rate would turn off if it's going to turn off. And um, so we're, we're kind of, I think we're all in kind of a wait and see mode, but we're cautiously optimistic. When you do recordings, um, Justin, and let's talk about your, your show a little bit. Are you typically recording mm -hmm. from a camper in the outdoors as well? No, not usually. Um, that we're usually in studio uh, in Houston, which I would much rather record from out here and and do those type of shows, especially the remote ones. Um, but yeah, we're usually we're usually uh, we're usually in studio. That's the um, only reason I got to go back to Houston tomorrow. I got to do a show. You're taking a break. Yeah, yeah. I try to literally. I try to get out every time we have any type of of gap between shows or between like work functions. Uh, me and my wife are usually on the road. All right, nice. No, I mean you you're a busy guy, so I'm surprised to see you out there in the in the outback. <laughs> oh, I'm still um, working. I'm still working, but we just like to do it from a prettier setting than the suburbs of Houston. Yeah, touch some grass. Uh yeah. we should do more of that probably. Um Justin, before we go any further, uh, this you know, this podcast is hosted um on Swan's YouTube channel, so there's a big chance people come fresh into mining content and have no idea who the both of us are. Um, would you mind giving them a, just a very brief background uh, to not bore the ones that, that already know you very well? Well, I can't promise they won't be bored, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm an energy attorney by background. Um, I worked in oil and gas for several years. Um, was at you know very large public company in Anadarko Petroleum who uh, was ended up being acquired by Oxy. Um, after I left Anadarko, I went kind of private equity route and, uh, started a couple EMPs that, um, were focused on production of hydrocarbons. And that's really what led me into the mining space. Uh, back in 2018, we had a wildcat well that we had drilled, which is basically a well that is away from any type of pipeline or, or infrastructure to get gas takeaway. Um, and we could not get um, a pipeline in there for any type of economic rate. And kind of after scouring different options, um, I had already been uh, very interested in Bitcoin. I've been buying Bitcoin, but I had not done anything on the mining side. I really didn't have any any clue about it. Um, but I had came across something about uh, Steve Barber up in Canada uh, doing work on vented gas, doing flare or Bitcoin mining off on vented gas, which is very similar concept to using using uh, flare gas for mining operations. And uh, so it took a little bit of convincing, but luckily our uh, operations engineer that we brought in, uh, he got on board with it mainly just to keep our oil production online. Um, and so we ended up getting a Bitcoin mine set up on a little 30 MCF a day uh, site. Um, and my curiosity just really kind of guided me to trying to figure out what we were doing on a dollar per MCF basis equivalent with the Bitcoin mining revenues. And my, uh, what we call in the energy space, my landman math kind of showed me that we were doing about seven to $9 in MCF. And so uh, when I thought we could compare that to us selling gas where we could sell gas for a dollar in MCF, it was like, well, this is a no brainer and I need to try to, try to monetize this on a bigger scale and raise some money for it. So that's what I ended up doing and raised some money and uh, started J Energy, which is a Bitcoin mining company. We used uh, basically only uh, natural gas to power our Bitcoin mine. And we grew very quickly, um, got up to eight, nine megawatts of uh, 
mining operations out in Wyoming. Um, and then I moved to doing some deals on grid in Texas and worked with some very large public companies, Texas Pacific Land, one of them, their largest landowner in the state of Texas. They have about a million uh, net acres out in the Permian Basin, which is a lot. They're also one of the oldest publicly traded companies in the country. And so um, getting them on board with doing some Bitcoin mining operations or even working with Bitcoin miners on uh, their property out in West Texas um, really was kind of, uh, I guess, a, a nice little feather in my cap and opened the doors to me getting to work with a lot more oil and gas companies and energy companies on how to monetize uh, their energy uh, through Bitcoin mining. And so that's what I've really started focusing on and have been kind of spending a lot of my time over the last, you know, two, three years was putting together large scale Bitcoin mining deals um, and also getting involved on them myself. So uh, that's really what I, I started doing. That turned into a law practice, which, um, you know, I know we'll talk about that a little bit, but from 21M. Uh, which we're really kind of primarily and, and really only focused on Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining work in the legal arena. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm also the general counsel at Adicon Energy. Uh, we're a large uh, infrastructure provider and player. Um, we, we are looking at some self-mining opportunities on a pretty large scale as well. But we have a, a site up in North Dakota, about 225 megawatts um that uh we are working with large-scale miners public and privates uh and have you know tens of megawatts of operations live right now and we're basically fully subscribed on our entire 225 right now so um we are going to continue to pursue opportunities like that and look to work with you know miners on developing large-scale mining sites that are um, you know, behind the meter, on grid, really kind of any anything in between too. So um, that's that's kind of my my story. And all that from a camper. It's impressive. Yeah, man. all that from a camper. <laughs> <laughs> that's very impressive. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're going to talk about the the law aspect of what it is that you do. Quick question: um, What is an EMP? Exploration and production company. So basically, it's the oil and gas company that goes out, drills the wells. And produces the hydrocarbons and then sells it was, to a midstream. All right, understood. I was asked this question yesterday. I would love to hear your answer on it. Why is it that so few, if there is few, um, companies that are in the hydrocarbon business uh, are still not using, or why are so few companies using Bitcoin mining to, to create extra revenue streams to date? That's a great question, and it's what I deal with all the time. And that you're, you're right, there's not a lot that are doing it. There are more and more exploring it, and I think there's a variety of factor, factors as to why it hasn't just exploded yet. Uh, number one being is that people don't understand it. Um, a lot of these oil and gas companies are kind of dominated by, you know, a more experienced uh, generation of folks, um, older folks that um, really have built their career on kind of a traditional model of, you know, we're working with fiat currencies and we drill hydrocarbons and we produce them and sell them to um, the off taker, which is typically a midstream company. Um, and that's how we generate our revenue. Uh, telling them that, hey, there's this, you know, internet money that um, you can start using to monetize your hydrocarbons that you're producing from your site. Um, they don't understand that and it seems almost like well why if something's not broke why are we going to fix it um so i think there's some of that at play um but with the education that's happening and also i think something that's undervalued is in the acceptance of companies like oil and gas companies getting into it is the etf i think the etf is really going to almost give folks like that or companies like that um, some cover to get into it because it's it, in my mind. And I think in their minds, you're going to see a lot of them look at it, that as a legitimization of the asset class. And so using a legitimized asset class to monetize these gas assets that right now are realizing, you know, a dollar 50 for the Henry hub price for natural gas. 
um, they're going to look for ways to create more revenue from that same product. And so that's the other factor that I think is going to play in is the market conditions with the, the natural gas markets is that they're very depressed right now. Um, and in all actuality, we saw kind of, I don't know, an outlier back in 22 and in early 23, where natural gas prices were just, they were way beyond what we had seen over the last 15 years. And a lot of that had to do with Russia. Um, there was other factors at play also. I think that the, when oil went negative in 2020, you tend to have a lag in the surplus of natural gas for the market. And so I think that came into play then too, a, a delayed reaction to the lack of drilling that was going on in that 2020 market. And so all those wells start coming on, all that production starts accumulating, and then you have a little bit of economic downturn, natural gas price, we have a surplus, and and, uh, and now we're back into a market that I think is more likely to stick around rather than seeing, you know, seven to $9 an MCF again. So I I think when you put all those factors together, go ahead. No, yeah. I mean, sorry, you you were I thought you were you were you were done with that. Um, sorry. I mean, the the thing is, what I don't understand um, uh, is like, why 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 does the approach of hey, like any of the gas that you're burning, you know, l- let me deal with it, give me mm-hmm. a low floor price, and instead of flaring it all off, I'll buy it from you at zero cost to you, um, without mm-hmm. even them having to touch you know, anything with magic internet money, they don't actually, do they actually need to understand how Bitcoin mining works? Um, I think they do. Um, mainly, th- there is a lot of pressure on oil and gas companies from a variety of different angles. Um, you have, you know, the political angle where you do have, uh, you know, one side in particular coming at oil and gas companies pretty often for their operations their activities being dirty. Uh, things like that. And so you've got an industry that already has their hands up playing defensive a lot against kind of the narratives against them and getting into a situation where they don't understand, you know, what is happening on the other side with their counterparty that is the takeaway. They need reliable takeaway. They want to know that this is going to be uh, occurring on a daily basis because if that, if the Bitcoin mine goes down and they can't, you know, get rid of the flare, that may cause them to have their oil production shut in, which is obviously a kind of catastrophic thing for them if, if this was prolonged. And so ensuring that they have good counterparty, uh, you know, reduce pa- counterparty risk by being with a very good operator and an understanding that I'm, if I'm producing gas, it's going to be taken away. Um, that That's a big thing for them. So that if they don't understand it, it's going to give them a little bit of you know, pause when it comes to bringing that on. And so they do understand the midstream game. So I deliver this pipelines here, I deliver it, it goes away. If it's flare situation, yes, it's an easier conversation to have with them about, hey, look, we'll come in and we'll buy this. I think what happens a lot is that, um, you know, the early negative or FUD against uh, Bitcoin was illicit activities and what is this going to be used for? And so when you're dealing with a you know, some older generation that hasn't got the Bitcoin education or understanding that like you and I do, and probably everybody who's listening here, they're going to be a little bit more apprehensive to just open their arms. Like, Hey, whatever you're doing with it, we don't care. We're going to sell it. It, it, I think there's still a little bit of like, look, we don't want to, you know, open up another door to negative media attention. If something comes out about Bitcoin, they don't know what it is. It's a fear of the unknown. Yeah, but then you, I, I would argue they already have their shields up defending what they do already. So might as well. Also, right, right. <laughs> also, well, and, do, and also defend that. Yeah, it, true, true. Um, and I think they're doing a better job now. I, I actually think the oil and gas companies have set a, kind of a negative model for how to handle uh, bad uh, FUD, right? They did not, and I worked in oil and gas back early, you know, back in 2009 is when I started. But um, back then, we really didn't contend with the negative media kind of uh, picture painting that was done about oil and gas companies. They just really didn't address it. And that built over time until you had this narrative that was almost ingrained 
with a lot of people that oil and gas companies are bad. Now, recently, I've seen them really combating that narrative by showing, you know, what products we actually have and products that have really enhanced the uh, sustainability and, and the productivity of the world and which has driven the technological innovations, the lifestyle innovations, all the things that we, the comforts of our life, you really could trace back to hydrocarbon production. And so they're doing a better job in showing this. And, but you, they stepped back and let this narrative form for so long. Bitcoin mining has done a much better job in the Bitcoin community, I think, combating that narrative early on that we're, our energy usage is bad or there's no use for it or whatever. I feel like we're doing a much better job combating that narrative um, than oil and gas companies. I will say this about the flare stuff, though, and this is coming from a guy who really got started with that, is that most of the oil and gas production, like 98% of it in the U.S., there is takeaway for that gas. And so there, it's going to market. Um, most of the wells that are drilled now have a takeaway plant. Like there, there is, there's a way to take away gas. There are obviously still um, areas where that's not the case and flaring does go on. Most of the time now though, most of the companies I talk to, they're very open to Bitcoin. Now that, again, that has changed dramatically over the last like seven months, in my opinion, at least the, the experience I've had. And even more so since the ETF was approved. It's almost, I've gotten a lot more calls where I'm not, I'm not reaching out to them. They're reaching out to me to talk about, hey, can you come in and explain Bitcoin mining and how it works? Number one, and this is the difference. This is shift so that we don't feel like we're leaving value on the table when we enter into deals with Bitcoin miners. So that that's a big change as well. That will happen more and more. And I also think we overestimate um, which parts of the world are jump on that bandwagon of, you know, all hydrocarbons bad, all fossil fuels bad. Like here where mm -hmm. I am, you know, big coal country, South Africa, people couldn't care less. You know what I mean? Right. right. Uh, and there's, so there's a large part of the world population that is not exposed to that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Look look at Ethiopia, right? They, within right. a year, they, they got a seven wealth fund to invest um, into Bitcoin right. mining infrastructure because they see the benefits, right? And it just makes... It gives independence as well. Um, and arguably, you know, using Bitcoin mining in this context that, you, that you're speaking about gives uh, these companies even more independence um, and, and independent revenue streams that are completely private uh, and, you know, is, a, is somewhat of a defense mechanism. But I understand what you're doing around or what you're saying around, hey, like if, if these Bitcoin miners are not profitable anymore and they turn off, we might have a problem. Um, in flare gas, less so because you can just you know, flip the switch and flared instead mm -hmm. again. Um, so yeah, less of an issue there. Um, Justin, digital wildcatters, right? Yeah. You already talked about the, all the operations that you that you do. Um, what is digital wildcatters? One of your projects? What do you guys do there around your your podcast and and empower? Can you explain a little? Yeah, yeah. So digital wildcatters is um, a digital media company in Houston. Um, they have focused primarily on kind of uh, creating content centered around oil and gas companies, energy companies in general, like renewables, behind the meter opportunities, and not just in Bitcoin mining, but kind of the energy market as a whole. That's our, that's our main target is the energy industry. Um, uh, that obviously delves a lot into oil and gas because Jake uh, Corley and Colin McLennan they're both from the oil and gas space and they're the founders of digital wildcatters. Um, but, but it, but it is energy focused, um, content and, um, energizing Bitcoin is the name of our show. Um, empower is the name of the conference that we put on. Um, and empower has, this was the third year we did it. It has grown, uh, tremendously. Um, we have it right now, 713 music hall in Houston. And but it is targeted towards that kind of education of it for energy producers of what the Bitcoin mining industry can do for them. It, it has, in my opinion, obviously, I'm very biased, but I feel like it is the best uh, Bitcoin mining conference 
that is focused on educating energy producers that there is. Uh, uh, most of the people that we get showing up to it, to it are from the energy industry, not necessarily from the Bitcoin mining industry. Uh, but they're they're it, they're curious in how to implement Bitcoin mining into their portfolio, and so it, it's nice to see because, like you know, this being the third year, we've had a lot of of repeat uh, attendees, and some of them. It's funny you'll there's always like one Bitcoiner stuck at these energy companies, and they've been kind of poking and and trying to do some orange peeling and. And uh, not pilling, p pilling, sorry. Um, but they've been, you know, doing that over time. Well, now it's like like this this last year, and actually we just signed them up for a company. They went from one guy going the first year to now they brought the brought out their entire executive team, and um, and recently contacted me about you know spinning up some mining op large scale mining operations. So I was I was really uh, excited to see that because it, it's kind of shown the impact of an event and what it can have on just the education level it may not it may take time but you end up seeing the fruits of that you know those efforts uh returned and so yeah it's it's been really nice to see that over the you know past three years of doing the conference i have to say i really enjoy you know working from home and then going to these events worldwide i mean it's, it's uh, always hugely beneficial next we're going to uh, bitcoin asia to just mm. see what's going on over there because that market's completely closed off to me. You know, Asia and yeah. Russia culturally have no idea what's going on there. It's all sort of America mm. and Europe uh, and partly South America. And so I, I happily, you know, would switch out even this room for a camper or, you know, and continue to go to these <laughs> events because contrary yeah. to what we sort of w were made used to in the, in the digital working environment during COVID is like, you know, Staying here, I'm much more productive one. And then, you know, to go out and meet people, you go to these events and everybody goes there to do the same thing. And it's always hugely productive. Um, so, so I love these events. Um, absolutely. What is the, you already said the mix of attendance is largely uh, energy people, right? Mm -hmm. What, um, what do you think is their killer argument that they, that they keep coming? Um, that these orange pillars in the company can poke them and say, hey, we got extra budget. Let's go to another event or whatever. Um, now what is the what is the mostly the reason they these guys show up? And, and yeah, I mean, you already mm -hmm. said it or alluded to it. But how do you get these sort of traditional energy guys to understand and to get interested to a point where they will send their whole C-suite team? Just dig a bit yeah. deeper there. Yeah. So, well, I think oftentimes like you, me, everybody that we generally talk to or that we have on the shows, right? Most of the time, if not all the time, we are experienced Bitcoin folks. We've been interested in or buying Bitcoin for a long time. We've been in the mining space and we get in this echo chamber and we, we it feels like we know everybody and we know everything about it. And it seems like common knowledge, right? But the reality is we are still so, so early on. And so there is this big education curve that still has to go on and, and is probably the most important aspect still is like the educating of the general populace about Bitcoin, what it can do, and then Bitcoin mining and the energy consumption and how it all works. And so I still think the biggest part is that, you know, last cycle, 2021, 20, 20, or early 22, um, you had a lot of people getting really excited, even at institutional, like institutions like large scale energy producers. They're interested and they're curious and they want to know more about it, but they're not, they didn't have enough to pull the trigger on. There were still enough red flags or issues that, that um, from a traditional kind of marketplace or industry, they don't really know how to handle it. Accounting is still an issue. Right. There's all these little things that they're not little. There's some of them are very big, but that prevented them from diving in. Uh, well, time has passed. Then that education process has continued. And now they saw an ETF and now they saw the Bitcoin price going back up when a lot of them, they're hearing Bitcoin is dead for the first time. We've heard it four or five times. Right. But they're hearing it for the first time. Right. Right. They're hearing that for the first time in 22, 22, 23. 
and they see an 80% crash. Well, and they hear us now that they've seen us over, you know, in 2021 and 22, they still hear us. And now they're seeing it's, oh, we're back. Just like those guys told us. All right. Now there's an ETF. Our market price sucks for getting, for selling natural gas. Like, let's go really explore this. We got a much easier time now allocating, getting someone to allocate dollars to it because it's a real asset class. And so I do think we're on the precipice of like a really substantial entry from players that we didn't expect we've talked about, but like, we're going to actually see it happen now. I, I really do believe that is that we're going to see market participants and entries from groups that we've said, Hey man, if, if they ever got involved, if the utilities ever got involved, if Exxon ever really got involved, instead of just selling gas to a Bitcoin miner, if they ever really got involved and started allocating some capital themselves, if next era, yada, 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 can name a bunch of groups, we're going to start seeing them actually do it. You know, they may be a little quiet about it, but the fear of doing that is really, I think, subsiding. And so I think that what what happened is that you had those early on Bitcoin kind of disciples that were planted in these companies that have been talking about it, but now they've got some data to back up what they've been saying over the last three years. And so it's a process, man. Three years feels like a long time to us, but to Bitcoin, that ain't. That ain't shit. It's, you know what I mean? Sorry, I don't know. We can, yeah. No, it's swear, all, swear all you want. It's all good. Um, all right, all right. Yeah, and and curiously, it happens on all levels. All right, it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, people who buy Bitcoin now you got the ETF. The one the one institution buys Bitcoin. The others are now thinking about it. it. Always takes that first dip. You know, the one Exxon does it mm -hmm. now. All these other are, are looking at it because it's now legitimized. You know, Ethiopia is looking at Bitcoin mining. You bet your ass, Angola and Uganda and all these other folks mm -hmm. are wondering, hey, how do we monetize uh, without permission? Monetize mm -hmm. all of these uh, stranded energy resources right. because people are not stupid. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And so I th think it's going to just keep rolling and rolling and rolling in that snowball. And I see it on a daily basis, as you said, working in this industry. Uh, the mm -hmm. snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger every day. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Do I, you guys get I'll mostly... Look at it. Go ahead. Well, I would say, like, it's like Parker Lewis. You know, the, even the name of his book, Gradually and Suddenly, give him a little plug on it. But um, that's how this all works. There's so many different ways that that works. But it, it's... Bitcoin is just such a unique thing and it touches so many different areas and I could get my tinfoil hat on. I was talking about it on the show, but like, I really even believe there's like a spiritual aspect to it. Um, at least there was for me when I really got going. And so I couldn't, I, like, I know that this will continue. Like I, I, I couldn't be more confident. Sorry, I got a thing popped up on my screen. Um, I couldn't be more confident in the future um yes there'll be ups and downs for a mining operator right you're you're gonna have the lean times but just prepare yourself to like make it through it because i i the, the whole TikTok next block deal and it's true um it's like a true natural selection process that goes through right now and but we're going to make it we're all going to make it and you just got to stick with it unless you host an s19 at seven cents and yeah. Right. They, yeah, you better find some different. I saw your post. Yeah, I saw your post. It's getting tough. It's true. Yeah, yeah, it is getting tough. <laughs> Do you get um, many international folks coming to these events that are not Bitcoiners? We uh, that are not Bitcoiners. No, we do get a lot of uh, international folks coming to the show, though, uh, uh, to empower. Um, in fact, I've picked up from for the legal practice. Uh, I've picked up five new clients after Empower this year, all international. So Middle East, South America, um, Europe, really all over the place. So, and that was in a matter of like two, two weeks after the show, all of them, all of them came back and, and, uh, you know, saw me at the show or, or heard me at the, at the event. That's awesome. We're going to hop into the law stuff now. I'm going to go and speak uh, in German parliament, Justin, pretty soon here about Bitcoin mining and what it right. can do in the world. What would you yeah. say is your one, one killer argument over all these conversations that you've had um, to convince people that Bitcoin is not a waste of energy and all of that? Right. Well, well to, 
depending on how much time you have, um, I think the, the best argument for Bitcoin min mining and the energy consumption is the furtherance of uh, renewable projects. Um, it undoubtedly it serves as a, a buyer for energy that is stranded, which typically is going to be a renewable project. The takeaway, and I can speak in particular for the US, um, transmission lines getting energy in stranded locations, which is typically where you're gonna find solar and wind development, is one of the biggest issues we have. And so a lot of these uh, assets can generate electricity, but they can't sell it to the market yet. Um, and so Bitcoin mining, miners coming in and working with renewable uh, projects allows them to generate revenue day one of operations of production operations, not construction operations, obviously, but production operations and allows them to utilize mining until the market conditions or the infrastructure is right to deliver power to the places that they need it. And further upon that, and actually in Africa, you guys have some of the best examples of what Bitcoin mining can do for areas that have had no power generation or power delivery uh, uh, options. Um, Gridless and what they do. In fact, I think he was just on your show, wasn't it? The CEO of Gridless. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that is probably the best story to tell to anyone because it does defeat the whole narrative that there's no, what is the purpose of this energy consumption and what is the purpose of, of uh, Bitcoin? Well, the purpose of Bitcoin, it, it allows people to transact, obviously, peer to peer without the uh, interference of intermediaries. Um, we may not recognize the value of all that, but in places where they don't have the same infrastructure that we do, it is a huge, huge impact for them. Um, I think what you've seen happen in El Salvador is a tremendous uh, example of what just uh, adopting Bitcoin can do for a place from an identity perspective. El Salvador has transformed their entire uh, kind of standing in the world and, and for people to act like it has nothing to do with the bitcoin adoption is completely naive it's a hundred percent what it's it's tied to so um i think there's more and more examples of like countries recognizing the value that um bringing bitcoin into your economy in some form or fashion is going to help uh enhance the life of these people and, and if you look across the board, one of the greatest um, positives for a, a lifestyle for people to bring them out of poverty is their access to cheap, reliable energy, because along with that will come access to the Internet, uh, business opportunities, things that they that were not there before. Just by bringing energy to them allows a whole new economy to emerge and blossom organically. And so, I, I mean, I really think energy is the the most important uh, kind of capital there is in the world, and that and it's kind of time tested. And so, harnessing the energy that you have locally, regionally, and at, on a country or continent level is only going to enhance the lives and primarily the lives of the the people at the bottom. And so, I. I I think from a story standpoint, man, I, I don't think there's been anything like Bitcoin um, or Bitcoin mining really during my lifetime. Yeah, same here. I mean, it's it, no, without a doubt a revolutionary innovation, right? You don't see that every mm -hmm. every week. Um, I do fully agree with you. I mean, having worked uh, for a German company that sold power in West Africa, we know we saw exactly that. You know, energy is the fundamental. Um, base for for all life, right? And the difference it makes. Um, but then also to add to that, running a business in Europe um, and getting a bank account in order to like buy ASICs in Asia and send them to clients uh, all around the world uh, via USDT. I also really appreciate Bitcoin and being able to send it mm -hmm. freely peer to peer without any intermediaries, because it sometimes oh. feels like these banks are like uh, extended regulatory bodies of the EU right. governments, right? And it's it's so tough to to get a bank account. It's completely crazy. Uh, it's, um, it, unfortunately, it's still tough here. Um, we just had a closing on uh, Friday for a site. 
I will say this though, man. I'm I'm usually the first person to rip on banks. Um, and I don't know if this was just because one of the the people that was involved in the transaction is kind of a, a high profile guy, but um, the bank really came through with pushing a wire through when I did not think they would do it. And so I I will give this the, the them credit that in that instance the bank was really helpful. However. We wouldn't have needed to use them at all if we could have just closed with Bitcoin. Look, I'll tell you a funny story, okay? Today, I showed this to my wife and I said, this is exactly why I'm doing this. And these, these fuckers are going to get so disrupted. It's insane, <laughs> right? You, you're, sending, you're sending, I don't know, a couple K, right? A couple thousand right. euros. And I'm getting the money in euros in my bank account and I want to send it to, to an Asian nation, right? Um, and first off, they charge me 50 bucks in fees. And the next <laughs> right. step, they ask me, where's the money going and why, what are you buying with it? It's like, right. fuck the UK. Right? What, business. Are you, yeah. what are you talking about? And then the third, here comes the kicker though. The third thing is, that as you are sending US dollars outside of the US, there may or may not be additional banks involved and the recipient may or may not receive the money that you're trying to send them, basically. Right. Okay. Here's 50 bucks fee. So, what is it for? Right. If all of it gets there, we don't know. You might have to send more. Like what? Yeah. What's going on? Right. Like, this is insane. Yeah. It's Absolutely insanity. Absolutely insane. Absolutely it's insanity. Crazy. It, How are you so, the, supposed the, to do business like that? You know what I mean? You, you can't. You can't. And like, I really, again, I don't want to get the temple hat stuff going too much, but like, <laughs> At the end, uh, when we look back on this period, like everything feels during our life, like we feel a, a, everything's a snapshot of time, but it feels like eternity, right? But we're going to look back at a period because really the system we live in right now is not very old, not not from no. an execution standpoint. I think you're talking maybe realistically like 50 years, 60 years, maybe. Yeah, and 71. Right, right. And so... This whole time, I really think one day, not too far from now, there's going to be kids that are like, what the hell were they doing? I don't understand. This doesn't make any sense. And the world we live in now that is so hard for us to imagine being different, and that's why these people struggle getting into Bitcoin sometimes, we're going to look back on and like, why would they ever do that? Why was it that way? It made no sense. And, you know, that'll be a happy day for me. Yeah, um, it's yeah. I, I my kids they're gonna ask me, you know, a couple of years down the line, how what I feel. Yeah, exactly oh yeah, way. yeah. Yeah, I Justin. my kids will think it. I, I've tried giving my son like dollar bills to go buy stuff, and I've watched them. It's easier for them. they understand use right. They understand using a card way more than that. And my son like he'll buy. Uh, I don't remember what we were called on Fortnite, the like V-Bucks. Like, they transact with those, like, no problem, right? And not that I'm not a shit coiner by any stretch of the imagination, but, like, watching them transact with that is just an indication of, like, this is where your transactions will go. They're going to be digital. Like, absolutely. So why would the most sound form of money we've ever seen and probably that's ever existed not be the kind of basis of what that digital economy will be built on. Why would it not? Yeah. It's no lightning, brain. Lightning pockets, pocket money, pocket sets. Um, right. And some, I, I, that's a weakness of mine, having, you know, countering my excitement about that future and, um, and talking to somebody like you who fully understands this and just ripping about it is phenomenal. It gives me, it makes me happy. Right. Yeah. But then like, yeah. when you talk to folks outside, you have to sort of <laughs> rein it back Temper in a bit. It. Yeah, right. exactly. To to make sure they don't think you're absolutely crazy. Um, I think all mine think I'm absolutely crazy. So uh, <laughs> I live, I'm running around in a camper, man. I'm running yeah, around a camper say, for work. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. you, you, you're definitely up there in the crazy scale. Uh, Justin, <laughs> let's, let's talk, let's talk about law. You're a lawyer. Are you a lawyer? I am a lawyer. Did you, you passed the bar. I passed the bar. Why is it so surprising to you, Jesse? You're in a camper, dude. I'm just going to say it again. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so why, why is there such a big gap uh, in 
in your trade when it comes to Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining? And why is it so important that somebody like you who understands how to navigate complex legal systems mm -hmm. uh, to give advice to folks? Why are they interested all in you all over the world, it seems? Right. Well, um, I think the reason that they're interested in me, I, I, I think, is because there's not very many of us, like you point out. And, um, you know, obviously, I, I, I got a little bit of a platform in our small space and um, with digital wildcatters. And so that has really been a that's been a, a nice benefit um, and something that, you know, I appreciate from Jake and Colin and just they're good guys to work with, man. It's, it's, so that's been a really big help. Um, but also, I think the fact that uh, I went out and did it. I, I actually, you know, started a mining company and kind of put my money where my mouth is. And also that gave me a level of understanding that I think you're not going to find in most kind of attorneys. A uh, guy with actual hands-on experience, having done the same thing that you're doing and understands, I think from the, the biggest point, understands the potential ramifications and how this industry works, the booms, the busts, what can happen during the bus if you don't have your legal uh, kind of contract contracts or deal structures set up to weather these storms? I think that's probably the biggest factor for why I've had some success with it. Um, but why group why attorneys struggle getting into it? There are some really good attorneys um, in the space uh, that that are Bitcoiners. There's not very many of them, um, but there are some and there are more and more coming into it, but I think you run into kind of the same situation in this industry as you do with uh, with the oil and gas companies. You got highly educated, very intelligent folks. You have to the shocker, but I passed the bar. But you got to pass the bar. Um, there's it's a lot of work and it's expensive to go, and so you've got typically a group of people that probably for the most part come from a little bit better. Uh, or higher income status or, or wealth. And um, and they, sorry, my wife's taking off. I love you. I'll see you later. Um, but uh, she's wonderful, by the way. She's amazing. She's my, she works for the firm as well. So, but, um, but they, they have made money and made their lifestyles on one way and that's fiat forever and so when you start hearing all this talk about you know this is going to replace that or this this is the problem with the dollar this is the problem with how you've made your existence or how your parents made their existence or how their parents made their, their existence and put you in the financial spot you're in today i think that's probably so, so looking at it from a sociology type of standpoint or mentality standpoint i think that's probably why there's not as many attorneys that just dive in because we we're probably very analytical thinkers and we look at it and like that doesn't make a lot of sense like this is crazy you're telling me that everything we've done to this point is built on this premise that is is dying right and it's i think it's just a tough thing for people to accept and jump into when you've got demonstrated success stories in your family or in your own life that you got to kind of overcome to accept that this fiat dominated world we live on is, is not going to be this way forever. And that there's this new avenue to kind of take on the, the standing that we've had. And do you want to jump into that? Or are you going to look at it apprehensively? And most of them tend to just kind of look at it apprehensively. Yeah, because it also takes somebody who can, you know, see that they might have been wrong about things or that they don't understand right. any much about nothing uh, and be curious. You know, that's why if you look at Bitcoin only from a legal angle, right, you probably mm -hmm. quickly end up at, hey, what is money? And the government says this is money legally. So, you know, right. you need permission mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, and then you end up not not doing anything about it. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you there. Um, but Justin, give me, give me your pitch. Firm 21M what's the pitch there how do you do you need to pitch to new clients it sounds like um of them come to you first anyway yeah i mean we've been very very blessed so far and the you know I, i haven't had to do a lot of pitching um 
mainly again because i don't think there's a ton of people in the space that they could go to and also um you know i i think what i tell people when i do talk to them is that you need to have attorneys in this space that understand the pitfalls when things are bad you may do a deal now but you need to be doing the deal now when i say now now is the time to really understand the how bad things can get um but if you do a deal say you do you're working on something that, at a higher priced environment where hash prices is, is higher and everybody's making money people fly through and they start making deals and you had attorneys jumping in, oh yeah we can do these deals we'll put this hosting agreement together for you your, your margin's three cents you're clearing on these you know these fees for the, your clients well that's not going to work when hash price is 49 dollars a pet hash so 50. So um, if you don't understand the economics as an attorney and the mining profitability and the modeling things out and how power agreements work and, and utility level uh, projects work, you can really, you can destroy a company so fast. And so um, understanding counterparty risk, understanding mining economics, I think is completely paramount for any attorney getting into this space. And that's why a lot of the clients uh, that we have now, we're using very large law firms that, um, you know, if you ever told me I was competing with some of these law firms at our, you know, firm 21M, I would have, <laughs> I would have never believed it um, because these are, you know, highly educated, best law schools in the world, some of the biggest law firms in the world, but they don't what? understand mining economics. And so, and you got to pay them to learn it, right? You got you're right. paying their hours, their billing right. hours for them to teach themselves, and you're already there, right? So, right by design, you cannot compete them easy, right? And our and our fee structure is reasonable. We're reasonable. I mean, I like uh, Rachel Silverstein is uh, the other partner over there, and you know she was the gc at clean spark for three years and she was at uh zappos before that she's very very experienced very knowledgeable uh she's worked at utility she's she's great and uh she does a good job of uh working with clients and she's personable too and so um i think that we've got a really really good foundation right now to like build something uh a lot bigger and that can really provide some services to small clients all the way up to large clients and, and that's currently what we have what kind of give me maybe the, the the base case for the most common legal pre problem that you that you help folks out with just so that um, a bit of a better understanding yeah i'd say the most common uh document that we're putting together is a hosting agreement that's probably the most uh frequently um drafted agreement for us uh, close behind that, well, I don't want to say too close, but the second most one would be PPAs and working on some power purchase agreements, typically behind the meter stuff in Texas, but we're starting to work on a lot of other stuff. I have been doing a lot, you brought up Ethiopia, we are working on stuff in Ethiopia, um, Oman, Bahrain, really kind of all over the world. Um, but those are typically either PPAs or um, like gas purchase agreements for some flare stuff, things like that. So um, most of it though is is hosting agreements and JVs, okay. doing some JVs too. And on that um, bit more, how I, I that's what I asked myself earlier. How do you and is that maybe also an asset that you have? How do you um, if there is legal conflict? Right now you're do, dealing with other attorneys, uh, you're dealing with judges and all of that stuff. I've, mm -hmm. as you can tell, zero, zero understanding of about that world. How, how do you deal with the fact that those counterparties have zero idea about how mining economics work? Um, yeah, that, that's a, that's a very good question. There's not been much, if any case law really on the mining side yet, um, for anything really large, substantial involved with like operational issues um obviously there's been some bankruptcies that um of course scientific all that uh the celsius stuff that um bitcoin mining is a part of 
Um, and so you got trustees that are getting involved and kind of, you know, what do we do with some of these contracts? How's this going to shake out? What What is a good uh, value somebody's bringing for some of these uh, bankrupt opportunities that there are? Um, so, but we really haven't gotten to situations yet where you're dealing a whole lot with like, at least I haven't, um, where you're dealing with courtroom matters that uh, are operationally specific for Bitcoin mining. Um, I, you're going to obviously over time get more and more of that. Um, it's just the nature of an industry getting bigger is you're going to have more litigation. But we, we are not litigators. Rachel has done some litigation in the past, but we mainly focus on like transactional work and operational contracts, things, things like that. But really so far, there's not been a ton of, of I guess, operationally focused litigation matters through the court system here. Justin, we're running up on our hour. I have two more questions for you. First, yeah. did I ask you, or didn't I ask you anything that you wish I had? Anything there still that you want to cover? Oh, um, oh man. Um, no, nah, you're, you're good. You're doing a great job. All right. You, when are you going to come on my back. show? We need to do a crossover. Yeah, absolutely. Any day. Um, I still have a bunch of them on my list here, but we'll have to do that next time. Yeah, um, yeah. Justin, last question. Does Bitcoin use enough energy or not? No, it needs more. And it's always going to need more. And that's okay. That's a good thing. Uh, it means the network's growing and um, Bitcoin is doing what it's supposed to do. And yeah, I, I want to see it continue to use energy and continue to use a lot of it. So uh, there's there's a lot more opportunities for energy from all kinds of different sources. And I think things that we haven't even discovered yet. And I think Bitcoin mining is probably the catalyst to create better and more efficient uses of energy than anything we've ever seen. So no, I want to see it use more energy. The ultimate customer. Justin, where can people find you and what you do? Uh, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Justin Ballard, Justin Bear Ballard. Bear is my nickname that actually most people call me. Um, actually feels like I'm in trouble if I get called Justin, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm an outdoorsy guy, but um, uh, you can find me at yeah Justin Bear Ballard on LinkedIn or uh, JLB underscore Oso on Twitter. Um, Telegram, I'm at JL Ballard. Um, I'm also yeah, man, that's basically it. So any of those spots, Firm Twenty One M, you can go there from Twenty One M dot com. Um, or AtticonEnergySolutions.com or AtticonEnergy.com, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm GC over there. And yeah, so you can find me a lot of places. You're covering a big range. Guys, if you need somebody to shoot the shit with, need more mining content, if you need legal advice, if you need a hosting contract done, any of those, contact uh, Justin. We'll leave all the links in the show notes. This was Hash Right Up. Next Sunday, we're going to talk mining again. Uh, have a look in the show notes, leave a like, leave a subscription. Me and Swan will appreciate it next Sunday. As per usual, no idea who it will be, but I'm sure it'll be interesting. I'll see you there. Bye-bye.